Prescribed Drugs and Traumatic Brain Injury, Part 1, presented by Dr. Gregory Oshanik. So we're going to talk about why it is that we use medications in individuals following brain injury. Um, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters, hormones, cofactors, uh, and talking specifically about the ones that influence behavior and thinking, cognition. Uh, we're going to talk about strategies for medication trials, the misuse of these agents, and unfortunately there is a fair amount of misuse that occurs, uh, and then tolerance difficulties and side effects. The neuron is the basic unit of brain function, and there are 10,000 neurons that can fit in the space of one millimeter, so the size of an eye of a needle. That's important because the average MRI scan, a 1.5 Tesla MRI, gets you down to a resolution, a magnification of one millimeter. So anything smaller than that can't be detected on most of the MRIs that are in hospitals across the country. Few MRIs that are three Tesla get us down to a half millimeter, but that still leaves 5,000 neurons so that you will not see in terms of damage. Mature neurons have specialized functions. And actually, there are clusters of cells. Anybody who has seen anybody who had a left hemispheric stroke and is aphasic knows that those areas that are involved in the production of language, if they are destroyed, they are absolutely impossible to return because there's not reduplication. Many other parts of the brain there is reduplication, and, or is uh, duplication, excuse me, and so in that way, we've got some ability should something happen. Prime example, if you learn your foreign language, your second language, before the age of five, that information stays in the left frontotemporal region. If you learn it after five, it's on the right side. Okay? And so, the earlier you learn your foreign language, the earlier and the more indelible it is on the side that normally happens. Mature neurons have specialized functions. They develop over the course of your life. Um, the last to develop, and those of us that have had teenagers know this, the last to develop are the frontal lobes. They don't develop fully until the age 23, 24. The vast majority of other earlier basic functions are solidified in men, or men, excuse me, boys, by the age of about nine, and in girls around the age of seven or eight. So girls mature faster than boys. It's because we're genetically inferior. <laughs> um, now, if we, if we look at the population of cells in the brain. We have the neurons and we have glial cells. Glial cells are the skeletal structure. So it's like going down uh, to Tarpon Springs and buying a sponge off the sponge boat. What you're buying, what you're buying is the skeleton. You're not getting the live organism. So that's what we're seeing in glial cells. And the issues in terms of the actual neurons are the ones that are absent in that sponge that you bought off the dock. Electrical activity, there is a coupling of electrical activity in the brain to neurotransmitter release. The reason why we can do EEGs is because there is an electrical discharge as I'm talking, as I'm breathing, as I'm thinking, as I'm just existing, that can be measured by surface electrodes on the skull. Okay? So that's the connection that we're seeing. Here we have a drawing of a neuron, and you've got the cell body, this is the axon, diffuse axonal injury, okay? That's the primary damage in traumatic brain injury, is tearing or the dissolution of this because of chemical reasons. So the axon is the leg that then carries the neurotransmitters down to the synapse. You've got very cleverly, presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. Um, they're packaged. Each neuron pretty much has only one or two 
primary neurotransmitters that delivers. On occasion, there's probably uh, some that have more than that. But for example, serotonergic neurons will only release serotonin. Noradrenergic neurons only release nor norepinephrine. Dopaminergic neurons only release dopamine. So they're pretty specialized in terms of that, and they also are fairly specialized in terms of the region of the brain that you find them in. As the uh, neurotransmitters are created through a series of chemical reactions, they're put in these little vesicles. These little vesicle storage units then, after the electrical impulse, are released into the synapse and then attached to receptors on the next neuron down. This is really critical in terms of how all of our medications work. Our medications work uh, in terms of interacting or interfering this basic area. So, we can, the four mechanisms that happen to terminate neurotransmitter activity is it can get sucked back up into the cell, it can actually attach to the next one down, it can be diffused out uh, and broken down by two different uh, enzyme types of, of activities. This is all being bathed by cerebral spinal fluid, okay? The same stuff that when you do a spinal tap at the base that you can draw off. So by checking cerebral spinal fluid, and this was done, a lot of this work was done back in the 80s, by checking CSF, we know what happens in terms of various points in time after traumatic brain injury. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, obviously we don't do you know, neurotransmitter assays on every patient because the types of studies, the doing spinal taps on everybody just obviously makes no sense. So we're using that information from before to basically help us manage and treat. This is the scary slide. Um, there are several different types of neurotransmitters I talked about norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. Um, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that is primarily involved in terms of memory. So the medications that are used for dementia, for Alzheimer's, the Exelons, the Aricepts, things of that nature, all act to increase acetylcholine activity in the brain. Norepinephrine and dopamine are basically uh, excitatory. They engage, they, they are involved in learning, they are involved in remembering things. The reason why people who have PTSD have flashbacks and nightmares and things of that nature is because in that fight or flight horror that occurs, you get a surge of adrenaline. And that surge of adrenaline resets those circuits so that whatever happened is, is recalled much more indel indelibly. For example, if I ask people, what did you do on June 2nd, 1995? Eh, who knows? If I ask you, what did you do September 11th, 2001? Uh -huh. yeah. Everybody can tell us where they were. Yeah. And that's because as a collective country, we ended up having a surge of adrenaline. And we can probably march through every single solitary thing that happened. So, in essence, PTSD because of the surge of norepinephrine and to some degree dopamine, is a disorder of remembering too much, okay? As opposed to TBI, which is unfortunately a disorder of remembering too little, okay? In a very gross way. Serotonin puts the brakes on. Serotonin is the neurotransmitter that gets increased when you have that big turkey dinner, okay? That's what helps you get sleepy. The glass of milk, warm milk before you go to bed. That's what helps put the brakes on. So things that increase serotonin, put the brakes on. Things that decrease serotonin, release the brakes. Okay? So frontal lobes, we'll talk about that, are very rich in serotonin. If something happens to damage our frontal lobes, you have disinhibition. You lose the brakes. Okay? Now, interestingly, the other thing that affects um, the frontal lobes, and it's not on here, are hormones. Those of us that have raised teenagers know 
that hormones affect frontal lobes, affect judgment, affect insight. So hormones play a role in terms of the process as well. Hormones more change the climate. These things change more the immediate kind of activity. So hormonal changes, anybody who has unfortunately had their thyroid gland go out on them, and you know that as your thyroid hormone levels are dropping, you're feeling duller, you're slowed, your metabolism's down, you're not as able to think as rapidly, all of those kinds of things. So um, hormones play a role in terms of climate as opposed to the actual weather for the day. Amino acids are important and GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, is the most prevalent inhibitory neurotransmitter in all of our central nervous system. 80% of the neurons in our CNS inhibit the activity. The reason why the infant, the newborn infant, when they start crying, start going into the moro, is because they're not hardwired to suppress it. As our brains mature, things are being suppressed and inhibited. Okay? Which is why, as clinicians, what we look at are, are evidence of reflexes that are, quote, disinhibited then. So whether if you're talking about the Babinski, okay, stroke the bottom of the foot and the toes flare up, you do that to a newborn infant, you do that to a, an infant up to the age of about six months or so, you'll get a flare. After that, the pathways are inhibited. Damage those pathways and you'll see it come back again. So it's an indirect sign of the damage that's occurred. So it's a loss of that inhibition. Most people in the audience have probably had some familiarity with, with things that increase GABA. Um, if anybody's ever had a Mai Tai or beer, alcohol increases GABA. By increasing GABA, you slow down the firing rates. You slow down and suppress the activity of other brain cells. If you're starting out at a normal level and you're dropping it down a little bit, yeah, it can kind of help suppress some of the, the stress temporarily. The problem is if you're starting from a low level already because of an injury and you suppress it even further by adding alcohol, by increasing GABA, you're getting into a more significant problem. Okay? Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And glutamate is, is important in terms of traumatic brain injuries in the following way. In any type of injury, mild, moderate, or severe, with the injury you get an increase in glutamate release. The increase in glutamate release excites and starts firing off things much more in terms of each nerve cell. There are two things that neurons need to work. One is glucose and the other is oxygen. And you have to have a continuous supply of both of those to function. That's why if you, know, if you drown, if you have a severe hypoglycemic episode, if you're strangled, if your heart stops, um, it's not, there's no storage mechanism of keeping those things in your brain for any, any significant period of time. So with glutamate, with the initial excitement of that, the neurons go into hyperdrive and they start churning and working more and what they then require is an increase in blood flow to supply the oxygen and glucose that it needs. <coughs> There's a mismatch though. The amount of blood flow cannot keep up. There are various types of reflexes and processes that kind of shunt blood away change the course, things of that nature. And so in that mismatch, you'll get an increase in activity followed by what's called a, quote, metabolic depression. Not to be confused with the blues, but a metabolic depression, a decrease in the metabolism. The importance there is in individuals with so-called mild traumatic brain injury. The metabolic depression that occurs changes the ability of the neuron to be able to produce structural proteins. 
So the, the basic skeleton that maintains the diameter of the axon as it, as it courses through the brain. So if you lose that ability to produce those proteins and those structural proteins, what eventually happens is you get a narrowing and a separation of the axon from the cell body. Think of a tadpole tail. Okay? This is a change that happens from the inside, though. A gradual change that happens. It's not a change that happens because of the shearing or the tearing, as you see, in terms of the force acceleration deceleration kind of event. If you have a force acceleration deceleration shearing, not only are you tearing that, but you're also tearing the blood supply. Every, every neuron has a microscopic blood vessel that's associated with it. So that with those forces, it will tear the blood vessel. And what MRIs and CT scans have generally done is they've looked for the residual of blood that's gotten out of the, the blood vessel and stained. Okay? So the fingerprint on the CT scan is actually the residual blood. It's called hemosiderin for those of you that want to know. If you guys have ever gotten kicked in the shins and you know that after the bruise resolves, there's that kind of metallic sheen in terms of the blood, that's the blood product, that's the hemosiderin, which is the iron containing portion of your hemoglobin molecule that is getting stuck in the skin. Normally, outside of our brain, those things are kind of removed over time, so the stain goes away. In our brain, we don't have the same mechanisms to get rid of that. And that stain stays, which is what MRIs and CTs are looking for. Now, the aside there is, hemosiderin is one of the most potent triggers for seizures. Okay? You drop a piece of hemosiderin, a, a drop of hemosiderin on a cell prep, and you will see the cells just kind of start seizing. So that's why increased irritability happens when you have that kind of bleeding. Now, back to the, to the glutamate. So what then happens, you get the initial shearing. You'll see bleeding there. But with this, where you've got the increased activity and then the decrease, the decrease causes this to gradually separate. Okay? That process can take anywhere from three to six weeks after the event. Okay? In the 1980s, when we were working on methods to improve outcome in severe traumatic brain injury, there was nothing we could do about the shear. All of the research, and even still, is going at looking at how do you prevent that secondary injury? How do you pre pre prevent what Ron Hayes up at University of Florida calls cell suicide? So he talks about two things. He talks about cell murder, which is the shearing with the bleeding. And then he talks about cell suicide, which is the gradual decrease. Now, because this is an internal thing, and because it has no bleeding associated with it, guess what? It doesn't show up on CTs and MRIs in terms of looking for the blood stain. The proportions of this are important when we're looking at mild. When you're looking at moderate and severe, generally the proportions of cell murder are higher than cell suicide. When you're looking at concussion slash mild traumatic brain injury, the proportion of cell suicide is higher than cell murder. So oftentimes CTs, MRIs that are looking for bleeding aren't gonna find it. C, uh, MRIs, though, that are using a new technique called diffusion tensor imaging, which actually look at the white matter pathways in the brain, can actually see it, these changes, whether it's caused by cell murder or cell suicide. But that's only seen on the higher level 3.0 Tesla MRI. Okay? The uh, group, the sports medicine group, in Tallahassee at FSU. That group is really on the cutting edge of looking at 
using DTI and the analysis of that in following and tracking individuals with sports-related concussions. Okay. So glutamate plays a role in terms of, in terms of that process. Now the other thing, just to, to point out, substance P and metencephalin, neuropeptides. These are critical in terms of pain and critical in terms of reinforcing behavior. So substance P is primarily a spinal cord substance, um, although there are, it is seen in terms of, of other brain regions, that is excitatory. And so if you decrease substance P, it slows down the excitation. Okay. And keflins, or endorphins, the runner's high, okay, are the natural endogenous opioids, the endogenous feel-good things that happen um, that uh, reinforce behavior. So it reinforces good behavior or bad behavior. Okay. The, um, the mechanism of action of placebos, you know, sugar pills, is through endorphins. Okay. So placebos really do create a change in the brain. They increase endorphins. If you give somebody a blocker of endorphins and say, this is your sugar pill, they don't get the response. Okay, so neutral sugar pills increase endorphins. Okay. Okay, so I was talking about neurotransmitter changes after TBI. In the 80s, it was observed that if an individual was agitated after their injury, generally that portended a better outcome. Okay? That if you hit the ground running, you tended to do better than if you did not, if you stayed there and were lethargic and not moving. Okay? If you want to take an evolutionary standpoint, those critters that got concussed and could still run away didn't get eaten and got to reproduce. Okay? Those who couldn't actually were, it was a less um, biologically appropriate type of, of response. Well, what Guy Clifton, who is um, a brilliant neurosurgeon, um, now is, is uh, up in D.C. He was chairman of, of neurosurgery at UT Houston. Um, what Guy Clifton showed with others was that when they did blood studies, that if you had an increased catecholamine, which is an increased dopamine or norepinephrine level in your bloodstream after injury, you had a better outcome. This is data from 1983. Okay? This is not new data. And in the 80s, we also learned that if you had low serotonin activity, that was associated with individuals who had bruises of their frontal lobes and agitation. Okay? So you've got less serotonin, increased catecholamines, so that you are more agitated initially, okay? You are less docile initially, which in the purest forms in terms of critters is what improves learning and recovery and survival. And that over time, catecholamine activity drops. Okay? The type of, of impaired initiation, those things that are generally thrown under the, the wastebasket term of extra pyramidal syndrome or Parkinson's, pseudo-Parkinson's, are declines in dopamine activity. Some of the lethargy, some of the fatigue, some of the difficulty in terms of balance, some of the difficulty in terms of gait, the loss of emotional expression, loss of spontaneity, the people that I would never play poker with because they can bluff you right out of your shorts. Okay? These are individuals over time who are dropping catecholamine levels. Again, data that's been known since the mid-80s. Part of the issue, I'm going to get on a soapbox for a second, part of the issue is the young kids now, when they're doing research, they go to Medline searches that only give them information on research that has happened in the past 15 years. 
So you're missing this huge body of literature that goes back into the 80s, where much of this stuff has, had, had been worked out. Any question before I move on? The question, the question was, CAT scans don't show it, MRI would, but if you've got a pacemaker or other kind of metallic uh, objects, or if you've uh, worked as, as a metal lather and, and things of that nature, a machinist, you can't do MRIs, correct. So what you then have to do is you have to use some other type of technology, such as a SPECT scan, which looks at blood flow to the brain and looks for hot and cold spots, or do a PET scan, which gives a radioactive sugar molecule delivered into the brain that then, as the sugar molecule is broken down, you can then get the release and you can see hot spots and cold spots. Yes, ma'am. Are they working on getting a stronger than a three uh, MRI and would oh, it be safe? There is a 7.0 Tesla that, um, there, that some institutions have. The problem is that if you stay in it longer than eh, about five minutes, you get a killer headache. Um, not killer, I mean, you get a severe headache. Um, there are actually, uh, the College of William and Mary um, in Virginia has a 34 Tesla MRI. Can't put a living thing in that. It's, looked, it's used to look at, at crystals and atoms and things of that nature. So yeah, the technology is there. It's just limited by our, our weakness. To learn more about resources and information provided by our experts, call Brain Injury Association of Florida's helpline at 800-992-3442.